Good evening, everyone. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the 15th General Plan Advisory Committee meeting. I'm Matt Ramey with Ramey & Associates, and uh, we are going to kick off the meeting now, and I'm going to turn it over to our chair to give a few words. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for being here. This, as he said, is a 15th GPAC meeting. Um, we are currently in the land use alternatives phase of the general plan process. This phase, as you all know, is critical. We've had multiple meetings, a lot of rigorous discussion and debate. Uh, about what's wanted and because it deals with land use it's it's been just a little bit contentious right the purpose of tonight's meeting is for GPAC to ask all the questions that you want answered um, about this process and about this section of the process any questions that you may have from the workshops uh, rumors things you've heard in the community anything anyone's ever said your own personal interpretations of what have been said this is a perfect opportunity to ask those questions we hope that we can clear some of that information up for you the land use alternatives explores ideas that came directly from the community through outreach process so as you know they went to the community councils they had stakeholder group meetings um, they had workshops for the different plan drivers, they've had surveys, and we've had two years worth of GPAC meetings, right? Um, and normally the G uh, general plan committee only lasts two years, but ours is gonna be three, so we're adding a whole nother additional year of process in order to make sure that we're transparent and we get as much, many questions answered as is required and, and have the opportunity to get as much input. Um, and so the community put a lot of different ideas on the table from, you know, we don't want that at all, absolutely not, to let's have everything everywhere, right? So we have to find that happy medium in the middle. The alternatives try to balance these ideas and provide different ways to achieve and use a vision and our core values together to guide us for the future. But we had a conversation and the economic um, development strategic planning committee meeting earlier today uh, where I was uh, explaining to um, some of them that the general plan process although we might plan to have development or we might plan to have some houses on this street or that street it is a plan and a plan only and the market actually drives what actually will happen so even if we plan for some of it it doesn't mean it's actually going to get built necessarily what it does is it invites the business community in, the, the ones who have the money to actually do those improvements in the city, and give them the opportunity to say, hey, we understand that City of Ventura is business friendly and we want to come here and do business. And that in, in directly in assists or benefits our sales tax revenues, our property taxes when they come into our city, and that funds our city services. And that's where this lies for me economic development and city planning work in concert together to help um, generate revenues for the city so that it can fund the city basic city services that we all want and need like lacing our trees fixing our sidewalks resurfacing the streets so anyway i'm getting off on a tangent there sorry we want to have a construct we want to continue a constructive conversation tonight so i'd like to ask everyone to be respectful of each other and the gpac committee members and the team and so we want to create a safe space for anyone to ask any question they want, share their different perspectives, and get, receive those answers. So with that, I'm going to hand this all over to Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lori. Thank you for the introduction. Um, we're trying a different setup this evening, so apologies that the GPAC has turned into two groups of sardines. Um, we can, if this doesn't work, we can work on it another time. We wanted to make sure that you all could see each other, you could see the screen, and you could see the public. So um, we can try something else next time if you're too uncomfortable with this. Um, let us know. Um, we can also spread out a little bit too if we need to. Uh, okay, so I wanna just go over um, a couple of things, but actually before I do, um, all of the GPAC members got um, a couple packets at your, uh, at your seat here, and I'm gonna turn it over to Heather, who will, communications director, who will talk through what this is. Well, thanks, Matt. I just got a title bump, communications manager, but I'll take a director. Um, also, public information officer. If I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Heather Sumagaisai. Um, I am honored to be here this evening, and I am honored to be a part of this community as well. 
Um, I lead a communications team. There are three other uh, people as a part of our team, and we help manage communication citywide for 11 departments. Um, so it is our honor to serve you. Um, we're the ones that are doing your social media, working on press releases if you sign up for our newsletters or get e-blasts even about the GPAC meetings. So if you ever have any questions or feedback, our door, our email, our phone numbers are always there for you. Um, what is on each of the GPAC members' uh, table here, as well as we have additional packets if you in the audience should be interested. Um, one of the things that is really important to us is having all voices, all community members, um, and everyone heard as a part of that. Uh, we have done extensive outreach for the last year and a half, and as a part of that, we've also created collateral and educational materials. Well, all of this is available digitally, but sometimes having tangible things in your hand that are easy to hand out make it really easy to have a conversation with others. So what's in this packet for all of our GPAC members and available to anyone in the community should you want one um, are coasters, our stickers, and flyers in English and Spanish um, with direct links to help connect people for where to go. Um, on those the Plan Ventura website. You can also sign up for our e-newsletter and we are regularly managing that and sending out information and we're seeing that uh, email distribution list grow monthly. So thank you everyone for your involvement and engagement and thank you very much Matt for the opportunity. Yes. Where does this go? This goes to the Plan Ventura website. And that way And, and I was actually going to say it goes under your drink. And why, why were you asking? There you go. So that's a much better answer. Um, uh, Pete. Yeah. Um, we're going to be covering, um, we're going to be covering that. We have not had them yet. We're doing the formal outreach first, and then we're moving to the informal. Okay, great. So welcome, everyone. Uh, I just want to go over, um, very quickly go over tonight's agenda. Um, this meeting is supposed to be informal this evening. Um, the land use alternatives are out, as you all know, and there's a lot of information there. And we wanted to make sure that there's an opportunity for the GPAC to ask questions of us about how we got to where we are today, what's in the alternatives, how to provide feedback, um, all of those topics. So we want to just essentially create a space where you all can ask questions and the public can provide comments and you can hear the public's comments. So there's very little presentation this evening. Um, we, uh, we are going to spend, um, a, I'm going to give a brief status update on kind of where we are and what we've done. Um, and then we're just going to go into question and answer. Um, we're going to start with one um, one question for, um, for each GPAC member and just go around the room. If you want to pass, you can pass. Um, and then we'll open it back up and kind of go around again so that everyone gets a chance to ask questions. We're going to leave about 45 minutes at the end for public comment. Um, if you are a member of the public and would like to speak, um, we'd like to know before we get to public comment so that we can, um, and there's comment cards, so we can calculate how much time we have for the public comment. Um, so if you fill out a speaker card, um, you can actually leave it on the table over there and we'll come and pick them up. Uh, and then we'll just um, calculate the time based on that. But we want to leave, um, you know, at least 45 minutes for public comment. Um, and then we're going we're gonna to wrap up the meeting um, at 8.30 this evening. So just a reminder that we are in, we have a six phase process for the general plan and we're really in the land use alternatives phase which is that middle phase. We've been working on it for a while. We've made it through the vision phase. The vision was endorsed by the council in March um, and then we um, spent a while, as you remember in the spring, working on creating concepts for land use alternatives. We are in parallel with this starting our work on policy development um, and what we find when we talk about land use alternatives is Ideas that come out of this process are not just about land use. There's lots of other ideas that are policy ideas. So we take those ideas as part of this and that forms 
the basis for some of the policies that are going to go into the general plan. So we're getting a lot of that great information. From there, we go to plan development and then review and adoption. Now, the alternatives, the process right now is that the public is reviewing and providing comments and understanding the alternatives. The survey is the primary form of feedback. There's actually 11 surveys online. And we will, um, we will take that information that closes on October 24th. We will start compiling the information and then we'll bring the information back to the GPAC. The GPAC will then have a discussion and help us understand what it is that we've heard in this process so far and the direction to go. And then from there, we'll go to the Planning Commission and then the City Council. And ultimately, it's the City Council who makes the decision on land use. Okay, um, so the role, I just wanna remind everyone of the role of the GPAC that we presented in the spring, the role of the GPAC for the alternatives. So you all had a bunch of meetings, provided a lot of input on different concepts and ideas, and um, we use that information plus lots of other information from the public process to craft three very different alternatives, which are intended for discussion. They're intended to elicit conversation. They're intended to try and achieve the outcomes. They are, two of them are very extreme examples, you know, all one way or all the other way. And so we, um, you know, we intended these to be, uh, to be something to start conversation, and, and it is absolutely doing that. Um, as a note, um, we reminded you in, in the spring that the alternatives would not come to the GPAC before they went to the public. And so you helped craft them, you helped give ideas, we then put them together, the public's gonna look at them and then they'll, they'll come back to the GPAC. We want you to participate in the community engagement and I know a lot of you have already. And then again, you're gonna provide input on the alternatives. Um, for the alternatives, we've had a lot of, um, of engagement so far. So we had our citywide workshops, um, August 30th and September 1st, one in person and one virtual. Um, we have had two office hours so far, one virtual last week and then in person last night here in this room. Um, those meetings, not incredibly well attended, but I think those who attended um, really got attention and, and I know that I see some people in the room nodding, yes. Um, you know, we, th it was, it's just a great time to sit down really informally, ask questions, generate new ideas of things that maybe we had missed. Um, so it's just a really good time, and so I'd encourage folks, if you have questions of us, come to the next one, which is Tuesday, September 27th, from 6 to 8.30, and that will be virtual. Um, if we need to add more meetings with the public about this, about to, you know, workshops like this, or um, office hours, we can do that. Um, we have now gone to four of the six community councils. We have Pierpont and College coming up on September 28th, both the same night. Our team is splitting up to do those. Um, we are also having um, two meetings focused specifically on the downtown. Those are now scheduled for October 11th. There's gonna be one that's more focused on businesses from 2.30 to 4.30, and then one that's gonna be more kind of resident focused from 6 to 8.30 that night, and both of those are gonna be virtual meetings. So again, if you care about the downtown, which everybody does, and you wanna talk about it, come on out to those meetings. Um, we've heard a lot about water throughout the process. Um, a lot of concerns about where the water is coming from to support development. So we're gonna be scheduling a, a water educational forum at some point in early October to provide information from the city on what the city knows about the water situation. Um, and I think that will be really helpful to provide some context. Um, and then as Pete asked his question, what about pop-up workshops? We're doing, we're spending a lot of time this month doing the formal outreach, two to three nights a week. My wife and kids are mad. Um, but two to three nights a week of doing this, and then we're gonna do the informal um, in October. And right now, the survey is, again, the primary source of feedback. We get feedback from lots of other ideas as well, and we take all of that in, but we really want people to take the survey. Um, so the surveys are the primary source of feedback. It's open until October 24th. We have gotten for the citywide and the downtown survey so far, close to 400 responses. So we're getting a lot of responses. Um, we expect to get a lot more before the end. Um, so that is the, um, the primary source and that the surveys are now up in Spanish as well. So they're in English and Spanish and if you need physical printed copies of them, let us know and we can facilitate that. We can send you PDFs or give you copies. Um, the last um, piece before we get into the Q&A session 
is that we keep adding information to the project website. Um, so the, um, some of the new information that we've put up there, we have an interactive online map, if you all haven't checked this out yet. Um, it um, allows you to really dive deep into each of the alternatives and really at a parcel specific level. We've actually even updated the information based on some comments that we got. Um, now when you click on a parcel, it will tell you um, not only what the, the existing use is and then the, the existing zoning, but it will have the base alternative and then, three, and then the three other alternatives with the designation. And then we added the number of stories associated with that to make it clearer. So you can see that. We also changed the, the color scheme of the purple on the map to make it easier to differentiate between the mixed use versions. Um, so that's all up online. There was also, um, we noticed there were a couple of minor mistakes that we had made in there, so we've changed those online maps. Um, we have, um, as I said, the Spanish surveys, and then we've actually now posted the land use designations, a revised version of that, with densities and FARs. So you can look at what those are as well. Okay, um, any, um, before I go on, any process questions before we get to the, um, from the GPAC, before we get to the going around and doing the Q&A? Yes, sir. That's a question. That's not a process question. <laughs> so, well, so we can we can come to that. So again, we're um, all of that information is all up on the website. So we, um, you know, encourage you to look at that. We I can answer that question later when we go around for sort of the the understanding about why we did each of them. Okay. Any process. We're going to start with, I mean, we're going to start just with the, the Q&A going through. If someone has a question that's really relevant, you know, we can go out of order. Um, but again, I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to ask a question, um, and then we can, we can dive in and go and dive deep on a couple of other topics. Nick. Do you think this might be a process question? I will, we will be the judge of that. <laughs> Yeah, well, so um, that, that again, uh, it's your, your, your borderline here on this. Um, so we, um, the, we're working on the growth projections, which is pretty complicated at this point and pretty detailed. Um, as we mentioned way earlier, we're, we're trying to get it so that the alternatives are generally the same range. They're not exact, but they're generally the same range of growth. So um, they, the jobs will vary. Um, they're generally the same range with the exception of the sore areas. So if you take the sore areas out, they're all pretty close. Um, and so they're all gonna have that same economic impact, generally, but, but we are gonna do a, a more of a fiscal analysis of them. Okay, that was right on the, right on the edge. Okay, yes. So I, I see this. Yes. Yeah, so, um, uh, uh, Lori covered this generally, but we, we have, um, no, no, it's okay. We have some meeting protocols. Um, I want to make sure that everyone in the audience has this. You should have picked one up. Um, and so if anyone has any questions about this, um, let, us, let us know. Um, again, we're, we're really here tonight because we want to be able to provide whatever information we can provide. We're not making decisions this evening. We're just exchanging information. And that's what we've done at the... Um, at the office hours, and, and really, it's been great. Like, lots of different ideas, not everyone agrees, but it's great, we're like having a, a dialogue and a conversation. So, um, that's what we're here for this evening. Um, okay, I'm gonna start, um, who want, which, which end wants to start the questions? <laughs> Sabrina, if you point, you know what that means. <laughs> okay, and, and, oh, you're gonna do it, okay. What's that? Pete volunteered, all right. <laughs> and, and Good point. You know, try, try not to ask, like, you know, the question that has, like, seven or eight parts to it, because we'll never get through. So, 
Okay, well, I'm going to leave the answer up to you guys because this could be long or could be short. So, so the land use designations will supersede zoning. So how will that work in transect zones like downtown specific plan where we have certain percentages allowed on a floor? I know there's the sentence at the bottom of the description that said it won't change, but if that property or parcel is designated mixed use five, or I'm sorry, mixed use four, does that supersede the zoning then, the, the percentage, or how would that be quantified? No, um, qualified? thanks, actually, that's, that, I'm, I'm glad we're starting with this question. Um, it's actually a really good question to start with. So we, um, just to, and I'm gonna try and keep the, it was, there was a very concise um, question, so I'll try and be concise on the answer. So we started with the, we had nine land use designations in like 50 zoning districts. And we have to bring them closer together just because of state law. And so we tried to, we created new land use designations, their draft, we can change them. Um, and as I described in there, that if you're, if you're a portion of a floor, that's the top of the floor. Um, we want to craft the, the land use designations so that whatever those portions of floors, 25%, 40%, 60%, 10%, whatever that is, that will remain. And we think it's actually, um, it is, we don't think that the general plan will supersede it by saying that, you have, that you're allowed to do a whole floor there. We think that because that's a portion of a floor and then we have a policy that says implement the zoning for that portion, for the specific plan that, that that will work and that's not actually, someone can't come in and say if it's you know three with a portion of four, they can't come in and say we want a whole fourth floor um, with the general plan. So that's the, that's the idea. We've also um, heard recommendations from, um, of why don't we actually make it more specific and have, if you can do 25% of a fourth floor, we have you know, the designation of 3.25. To, just to be really clear on that. And that's something that, that we're considering. It's, you know, it's not a bad idea, it increases the number of designations. But really the idea, unless we are specifically, there's alternatives that have specific changes to one of those zoning districts, we are not proposing any changes. So portion of a floor, it, it carries through. Do you have a follow up or, and actually let me ask, we can be. Well, um, my follow up was gonna be about the the designation of like 3.15 or 4.25 or something. Yeah, so it, it's certainly, yeah, I mean, it's certainly a possibility. Again, these are some of the ideas that, that came out in the process that we can explore with this. Um, we, you know, it, it helps for clarity, certainly. Okay. You're killed. <laughs> okay. Let me, um, How do you want to do it? We're going to trade microphones. So my question is piggybacking off of that, but um, with the case law that was in Yimby versus Los Angeles, and it was just settled last month, they found that the general plan trumped the zoning regulations. And so it didn't matter that the zoning existed, they still were able to move forward with the development because the general plan allowed for it. So what legal protections are there actually that would guarantee what you just said? And then I noticed also kind of on the same vein, the neighborhood uh, designations did have half stories in the new proposal, so two and a half stories. So I was just wondering why that didn't carry through with the mixed use as well. Yeah, um, okay, so, um, so one is we think that a portion of a fourth floor, you can have zoning that, um, it, 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 if zoning says you're 3.25 and the general plan says that you can go up to four, 3.25, three and a quarter, where 25% of that fourth floor is actually four stories. So we actually think it is consistent. The case law is really about someone, um, the zoning going to maybe 20 dwelling units an acre and the general plan going to 40 dwelling units an acre. And so that's where that case law is coming from, where the general plan is superseding. So again, that being said, we want to make sure that the concern you two are both raising, it, it, it actually is following through. So we're in agreement. We think it does that, um, but we definitely want to check that out. We can talk to the city attorney about that as well, but we want to make sure that it does that because the intent is not to supersede those. 
specific plans. The intent is to keep those specific plans um, as they are. A and it's true, maybe, maybe the, uh, the option is to do the, the 0 0.25, 0 0.4, or whatever that is. Okay. Yeah, I'm just, we're just gonna, but this is good. I think we can do, we can do piggybacking on this for clarity. Stephanie? Okay, so over the last few weeks, we've heard and seen a lot about heights. Can you explain to everyone um, the difference between the three options and which one has the most height throughout town? Um, and is, or is there a map that kind of you can overlay that shows the differences? Um, yeah, let me actually, I might actually need to give you this one. So we showed, um, there were some, okay, so we showed at the workshop some of, some of the maps about height. Um, and we know that height is absolutely a concern in this city. Um, one of the things that the land use designations did was um, the, the general heavy commercial, which allows everything from manufacturing all the way to offices. Um, that actually allowed six stories and 75 feet. There was sort of a global change that we did to kind of drop that down to really make it a manufacturing. No, I don't, it's, it would be part of the, the workshop slides from the first workshop. Um, so, um, and this is, um, this is getting to the previous question about what's the difference between the three alternatives. So, the three alternatives very broadly are, are looking at where development can go. So core is, think of it as west of Pacific View Mall. Um, expansion is east of Pacific View Mall, generally. And then distributed is a little bit more even throughout the city. Um, all of the alternatives, um, for a variety of reasons, reduce the area of six-story buildings compared to existing zoning, pretty significantly. Um, for example, um, existing zoning um, allows about 11.5% of the city, the geographic area of the city, allows six stories. In the, in the base, it's 2.7%, the core, it's 2.9%, expansion, it's 5.6%, and distributed, it's 4.2%. So here it is on the, on the screen. So this is for all designations. Now, we also recognize that, um, and, and the, t the two colors here, the blue is essentially the whole city, and the red is the areas of discussion. So it's the areas where we're creating, where we created alternatives. Um, do you add the blue to the red? No, you do not add the blue to the red. These are just percentages of the total. So you can see in existing zoning, in those areas of discussion, 40% it allows six-story buildings. Um, and then it drops, like the most is expansion, which goes down to 20%. Now, a good chunk of that is the, the general heavy industrial. So the next slide um, looks only at the residential. So the areas that allow residential, because you know, from what we've heard, that's more of the concern of the community. And so in the areas of discussion, um, almost 20% in existing zoning allows six stories for residential, and that's the mixed use, um, the C1A and the C2 designations, the zoning districts, um, are essentially mixed use zoning districts that allow six stories, 75 feet, and actually, if you do a mixed use building, unlimited density numbers. Um, so, we're really looking um, at, the, at the mixed use four, which is six stories, which is formerly the the C1A and exist C1 and C1A, sorry, C1A and C2 in existing zoning. So then these numbers then show the comparison between the, the, the base, the core, the expansion, and the distributed. Um, and you can see that even in the, within the areas of discussion, the highest is 8.5% and the expansion is 8.6%. So they all drop down. Um, so they all drop down from where it is right now. Yeah, so uh, the, the red is the areas of discussion. So if you've seen the prior maps that basically don't show any of the single family neighborhoods, the red is the portion of those areas that 
are six story. The blue is when you take the entire city, including all the single family neighborhoods, and it makes sense. Much more area, clearly there's no six stories. Our current zoning allows in single, fi single family areas. So that's why the two columns are, are different. Actually, I realized that, Kelsey, I didn't fully answer your question about why, why is there a half story in the residential. Um, and, and that actually is just, that's a carryover from existing zoning. We didn't want to change the, a, a lot of the, the residential zoning districts in the city. We really want to make that the zoning and the general plan one-to-one, -one, and the zoning has two and a half stories. And I, I think calling something a half story is kind of confusing. But um, so we, we do want some clarity in that in terms of what that means. Um, Stephanie, is that? Okay. So SOI stands for sphere of influence, and essentially that's the whole city that we're talking about. It's not, um, it's, there are some areas as part of this that are in um, the sphere of influence, but it's not the whole sphere of influence. Um, no, oh, um, so within, the, so 5.8% of the area in the city, not of the residential, 5.8% of the land area of the city allows six-story residential, currently. And all of the alternatives drop that down. Um, base is not just existing because there were some changes that were made to it. So there were some areas that um, just didn't make sense to have residential in them, like right next, right at a freeway off ramp. I keep talking about like the In and Out Burger. I think allows like six stories, seventy-five feet, and mixed use. Really, not a place that you want it. And so you know, we did make some decisions in the base to try and address some of those. Um, the, some of those, uh, uh, the, some of those issues. Um, okay, so is this? Matt, yep. base, is it fair to say nothing was increased in the base? I, I don't believe anything was increased in the base. But there were some reductions. There were reductions. So I don't believe anything was increased in the base, and and we can certainly. I know that there's been some concerns about that. Um, you know, if it, and let me just say something about the base, which is, it, which goes along with the designations. If you see something in the base that you feel. Um, is inaccurate, um, it doesn't make sense, you know, it's an error, bring it to us. Um, you know, we really want to make sure that, that we are using the best information. Um, so, you know, there was, there was translation that had to happen in some of this. There are um, commercial plan development, residential plan development, um, they had like a whole wide range of things that were built and allowed and we wanted to actually put a real designation on that. So there was, you know, there's some number shifts there that had to happen. Yeah, let me just go. Is this, it, Daniel, is this related to the? It is. Okay, yeah. What's? And I apologize it's so hot in this room. It's really warm. It's because it's I'm wearing a suit, so it's me. I'm, I am on the hot seat. Actually, everyone else is really cool. Okay, Daniel. Yeah, I, I read in the star that you had a spirited uh, discussion at the library about six stories. But what people are asking me and what I'm reading on next door is just to take a step back, what, what's the purpose of having six story buildings? Is it revenue, aesthetics, future growth? I don't really understand. So it's a combination of things. Uh, when we did the earlier surveys and got input, there was input from um, many interested in exploring more intense growth in some areas. We looked at six because we already allow it. Uh, uh, there's nothing magical about the number. Uh, there are alternatives that don't add as much six. As Matt's showing, in every case, we're lowering it. There are some places where it's added in strategic areas. If there's not interest in that, that's the kind of feedback we want to hear. Yeah. Okay, Pete, do you want a this, question? This relates to your, the map 
changes. So if something is identified as being mapped incorrectly on the PowerPoints or on the maps that are on the surveys, um, is it changed on the map or the survey, or is it only changed on the interactive we, map? So we, we didn't change it. It's changed on the interactive map. And, and the example, actually, you can just keep passing it down to Louise. Um, the, you know, the example, and this, this came out through the, um, the West Side meeting we had, where um, a local elementary school, we, we had a layering issue, and it was, um, uh, it was identified as a different designation, and it really should have been identified as a school. And so we changed that. Um, since a lot of the, the work was already done, we, we changed that um, in the interactive map. So you'll see, that, you'll see it in that interactive map. Um, but it's not in all of the other printed materials at this point. So but, but it is changed. So the interactive map is the most up-to-date? Yes, the interactive map is the most up-to-date map. And in fact, we can even go to that, and we can show you that it's, that it's changed in there. Yeah. And just to add to that, if it was a quick fix, like we could quickly identify and, and fix it, we did. Some of the feedback we've gotten requires more research and looking into, which we haven't made those changes uh, as it, I mean, there was some questions about some being areas being in SOAR that aren't, and so there's things that need more research. But if it was like, oh, we put the wrong color, or can you darken the color, we made those. And, and we, we did. Um the maps were already published on the survey, and so you have to sort of republish the survey and it messes things up, which is why we didn't do that. I'm just trying to identify it for everybody here yeah. where, where you're going to see a change. Yep. Probably a change. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Could you explain, um, we heard a whole lot of feedback, uh, at least on the 30th, about water. Uh, water supplies, water availability, et cetera, water for the future. Could you explain in as simple terms as possible why even though we are all concerned about the drought, we do have to be very cognizant of future water supplies, why we still have to do this planning effort? Yeah. Um, so we are, we are thinking with this plan, um, it is a, and, and has been, this is what the, the plan was from the beginning of the process, was to create a plan for 25 to 30 years out. Um, we know it is, it is, it's odd, right, that we're, we're talking about more development, which is gonna require more water when everyone's being asked to conserve. So we, we understand it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a strange dichotomy. Um, but we do need to um, think out into the future about how the city will grow and evolve. And then based on that, we need to do the infrastructure planning. And that includes thinking about water supply and water availability. It, it may come a point where the city can't grow because they don't have water. Um, but we, can, we still need to plan for that growth and plan for the evolution of the city into the future. Um, and whatever amount of growth that is that ultimately you know, the, the city council decides on, that we have to, the, that we do. So it's ultimately, again, the city council's decision, but we need to plan for that and we need to know what that target is so we can make sure that we can plan for it and get there. Um, and again, I do wanna, um, it, water is a complicated issue, as we all know, um, it's not, there's not a simple answer, and so we are gonna have a separate meeting on that because it has definitely come up a lot. Yeah. So uh, what happens if we run out of water? Like what's the plan? Is there a disaster relief thing? Like there's probably stop gaps in between, but is there any way of just painting that picture for us as to what would happen if that was to, like do we have someone that, I mean, I know we have someone that works in water, but is there a plan in place in case something like that was to occur? Yeah, yeah I think we want the water staff to cover it. Now, and I will say that, that communities have done lots of different things. Around, around this, and, and uh, sorry if I'm gonna go off script here a little bit. Some communities have said new development can happen if they can um, produce uh, a definite reduction in other places in the city, right? So it actually puts the onus on the developer to say, if you're gonna build, you need to actually figure out where that reduction is coming from. Um, so, you know, that's one strategy some cities have used. Other cities have just, there's just been a halt on development. You can't have new water hookups. Um, city of Seaside up north um, has that right now, and we, they did a general plan, and knowing that you can't, they, they're actually, you can't even build any new units in the city. Um, they still did a long-range plan for that because they're trying to plan for that future. 
Um, what, what will happen here, I don't know, and we'll let the water talk about it, but there are solutions like that that, that will allow um, development to make sure that um, either not happen or that it, it, they figure out their own water. Okay, yes, oh. So where in this plan is, um, is there an overlay, um, and forgive me if it's been told to me and I have forgotten it, I'm concerned about affordable housing. How much affordable housing of various kinds, um, can we write that into the plan, and where is it? I mean, I get, I totally understand the concerns about the heights of buildings, um, and I am all for density if that means there's more affordable housing. So how do those two things relate? And do we have any sense of how much affordable housing is um, written into this plan? Yeah. Um, great question. And, and we've heard a lot of concerns from GPAC as well as the broader community um, about the desire for affordable housing, the concern that all of the new housing that's being built is for is really expensive and for people's second homes and you know why are we even building this if it's not even for those who really are going to live here or who are here now so you know we've we've heard all of that the general plan can only do so much with this right we can't dictate who actually moves into a place who buys a house in the city or who buys a condo in a city um, if we could do it that'd be great, but um, you can, you know, the, the sort of you take it to its, uh, its sort of illogical extreme and then everybody's doing that. Um, so how much affordable housing is a really tricky question. The city is working on an inclusionary housing ordinance. Um, affordable housing for those who are in the affordable housing market is very difficult to build as standalone affordable housing. It takes 10 to 15 different sources of funding, um, it, it's, it's really complicated, it's very risky to build that. Um, so building that is a great way to do it if you have a, a, a local nonprofit housing developer who can build that housing. The other way that you get affordable housing um, is through an inclusionary housing ordinance. So a percentage of the housing um, is, is going, you know, and the city's working on this now, can be, of all new development, it can be required to be affordable at different affordability levels. So that's the other way to do it. it it's, it's never as much as people want it to be. Um, and, you know, we acknowledge that, but, but that's also the, you know, that's the challenge. There's, you know, if, if you say it has to be 50% affordable, no one's gonna build anything, and then you don't get any affordable housing. Um, so, you know, you try to right size that number um, for, the percentage um, of affordable housing and then the affordability levels, which are based on the, the area median income. You try and right size that so that you're allowing development to happen but still getting affordable housing out of it. So will there, when the, when the new uh, inclusionary housing um, ordinance, okay, is written, will there be able to quantify anything? Um, you know, if not precisely, then, you know, in a general sense? It will, it will quantify the percentage that is required for every new project, and it will quantify of that percentage what level of affordability needs to be constructed. Moderate, low, very low, extremely low. Um, so it will quantify what those percentages are, and, and you know, is it you know, 15% of the units have to be affordable, and of those, 50% need to be at low income and, and so on. So it will quantify that. It doesn't quantify how many actual units are going to be constructed, because that's completely dependent on the market. It could be that no one builds anything and then there's zero. So we just don't know. Okay, so there could be a number that is like, <coughs> this is the maximum given this plan if everything were built. You know, when with, with the growth projection numbers, sorry, this is, it's, it's really complicated, but you know, when we have the growth projection numbers, I mean, if you, um, you can take 15% of that and assume that those would, would be affordable. Now, it doesn't work out exactly that way because there is affordable housing, like full affordable housing being built. And in fact, one of the best ways, some of the best ways to actually get affordable housing is to work with um, institutional property owners to build housing, so churches, schools, um, you know, churches and schools in particular, the, the county who owns land. So that cost of land is expensive and their objective 
for those institutions, their objective is different than a for-profit affordable housing right, developer, right. Who, who, which is their bottom line is, you know, build housing and also make a profit in doing it. Um, a church who wants to build affordable housing, they have a completely different, you know, it, it's more altruistic yeah. with that. Yeah. So yes, ways and to so, encourage that is yeah. great. Thank you. I just, all of those, just saying all those things out loud is good to, for folks to hear. Okay, let's keep going. Thank you. So <clears throat> I have a general question and then I'll kind of bring it down into more specifics. So as we're increasing density for a lot of these areas or just building up to whatever is allowed in the, into the base, um, more stories are moving from commercial to residential. How does that address um, the impacts of increased traffic in terms of traffic mitigation? So my specific example would be the stuff that's been happening recently regarding uh, some projected projects around uh, by the mall, the Maple Street, Maple Court, they want to move some of that office space into higher density um, apartments and condos and so forth. And there's, it doesn't seem to me that there's uh, adequate levels of um, widths of street and numbers of streets and ways to get in and out of that area already, especially, you know, around the holidays and so forth. So I'm just wondering, how does that issue of uh, how do we mitigate the traffic impacts of all the increased density, especially around some of these high impact areas? Okay, so it happens in two ways. Um, so one is again, we're, we're at a high level now and still having these big picture discussions about where, where development is expected to go. So we can't do the, the traffic modeling of that at this point. Um, once we're, we've honed in more on a development pattern, um, we can then do the traffic modeling to look both at what's called vehicle miles traveled, um, which is the number of miles each average that each vehicle travels in a year, as well as what's called level of service, which is what we commonly think of of traffic delay. So we're gonna be able to do that um, after we have the, the alternatives, after we have a preferred direction, because it's, it's, it's timely and costly to do it. Um, and so that will tell us a lot about um, about the pattern. Um, and then when projects come forward, we then do another, there's then another analysis that, that typically happens with that, which is much more localized about how you mitigate the, the impacts of that. Um, the, the amount of development that's predicted um, and then the traffic model actually leads to a, a capital improvement program that's identified, which then can have traffic mitigation fees for projects. So the idea is you figure out where you're going overall, what improvements are needed to achieve that, and then you spread that out over the projects that are coming in to help pay for those mitigations. So there could be um, places where it says it's not possible to mitigate it. Or is, there, is that a possibility? Well, it's, well it's, it's too dense for the, the, for the options to mitigate. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think the city is not really moving to roadway widenings. It's actually the active transportation plan is looking at how to actually humanize the transportation network for pedestrians, bikes, and transit. Um, and so that's the way the... Um, um, <laughs> you got the finger wag. Um, that's, that's the way, um, you know, the city is thinking about transportation right now. Um, and, and you know a lot of the the locations for at least where some of the development is in the alternatives was is similar to where it's actually allowed right now so like the um, so you can the maps will, will kind of bear that out my question has actually already been answered but I just want to say that this interactive map has been fantastic so thank you to everyone who was involved I'm sure that was quite the effort and it's been amazing thank Good. you Good, and, and as a reminder, there's also a second interactive map on the website. We didn't want to put too many layers on, but there's a second one that has like demographic information and other information on it. That's on the website. Um, this is, the question is real, real basic. If there's a, a population decrease in a city, um, like we're kind of experiencing, um, why would we need more housing? Um, the population decrease is, minor and I, uh, it's, it's, and we, we always see fluctuations in, po in population. And so right now we're at a time actually in California where the population is, um, in the last few years, has decreased a little bit. Um, and so that's, that's actually pretty common. I, I don't think anyone expects that the population is going to continue to decrease um, over the next 20 years. 
Um, you know, if it does, then I think the, the plan might need to change, but I don't think anyone is predicting that that's going to happen. So we're all predicting that this is a blip. There's a minor increase because of what we've experienced with the pandemic, and then it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to go, um, go up. The other is that uh, since about 1980, the city has, the city, let me rephrase that, the state has been out of whack with housing. There has been a huge increase in population and a very small increase in the number of housing units. And that's why we have statewide why there's such a housing crisis. Understandable why it happens. Each community makes their own decisions. But the sum total of that is that not enough housing has been built relative to the population increase. And so the state is trying to address that through its very heavy handed policies. But that's the idea. We, we, even if there's a slight decrease, the prices of housing aren't dropping down even to the point where it offsets all of the, the need that we've had, the pent up demand and the overcrowding that we have. Okay, uh, kind of simple question, something a little bit different is the, uh, while we're concerned about heights, I'm also concerned about what we're encouraging and discouraging because my focus would be more interested in uh, design and character and how the buildings fit into that neighborhood. So I'm curious, I believe as we're talking about stories that we're actually encouraging square, flat top, boxy buildings, which is probably exactly what a lot of us have issue with. So I'm wondering if there's a way to put into this plan um, something to do with um, benefits if you add steeples, if you add roof lines, if you add, um, historical significant elements to your building food for thought okay all right um i'm gonna i'm gonna start with a really quick answer and then i'm gonna turn it over to peter for a separate project that's going on so um we hear you on the some of the projects that have come forward are very boxy they're close to the street um they don't they feel overwhelming, out of character, um, and that design matters. The design of the building really matters. Um, so, you know, we are going to, in the plan, put in broad design guidance, um, not standards, but broad kind of intense statements about how the design should be and the character that we want to achieve. Um, then the details are going to be left to the development code and the zoning code. And we, there's a project going on right now, which I'll let Peter talk about a little bit. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> as was noted on a uh, prior s slide and, and discussion, we do have a lot of areas that allow six-story housing right now. And uh, pretty much all of those are not in our form-based code areas. Our form-based form code areas are the areas that have more of the specifics about what the building needs to look like. Um, and even with those, we get some feedback that maybe still it's too close to the street and, and such. So it's not that the form-based codes are perfect, but we think they're much better than the standard zones that will only give you basic type of standards. So we're working on something uh, as part of the housing element for the sites we have to rezone. So it's not part of the general plan, but it's happening right now to implement the housing element and uh, if that is a successful tool, then that over, the council could apply that overlay to other sites that don't have a form-based code to start to apply those in the short term. Uh, but long term, we, uh, the types of things you're talking about need to be in the zoning. Uh, we do expect there will be uh, policies in the general plan that are going to call for new specific plans or new corridor plans. Uh, so. So the short answer is yes, we want to do that. And we, we, we hear from both the DRC members, we hear from the public, we hear from the practicing architects. If, if we had codes that explained what was desired, that makes it easier on the architect, uh, makes it easier on the staff, it makes it easier on the public, everyone will know what to expect a little more. So yes. And then just and then over to uh, to Lori. One final thing is I don't. It's it's not just for six-story buildings. It's for every stories, uh, all stories, all heights. A two-story building, you don't want all two-story blo um, boxes in an area. You want variation. You, you know, in architectural style, in height, in the massing of the building, in the setbacks. So you want variation all across the board. Um, so I understand that um, density bonuses were an, a concern. 
And I just want to know if you wanted the opportunity to explain or review that. My understanding limited is that uh, from what I've learned that density bonuses are allowed and, and developers can come in and pay for those density bonuses. But in my conversations with those who build homes and housing and affordable housing and market rate housing, they nine times out of 10 have no desire to pay that large fee, that permitting fee that's very expensive um, to get those bonuses and that most of them are happy at four stories, most of them. And I'm not saying some of them wouldn't, but if you have any further enlightenment about that or any anything to add regarding that. Yeah, well, that. let me just um, kind of answer this one um, relatively quickly. So, so everyone's on the same page. The state has a law and has had a law for, for many, many years to encourage affordable housing that says if you build a percentage of affordable housing and at different affordability levels, and there's a complex matrix that they have, then um, you can have concessions from the city to enable you to build that affordable housing. So the most common concession is adding an extra floor to the building. And we've seen that in, in Ventura um, at this point. Um, there are other concessions as well, whether it's setbacks or step backs or percent amount of open space required. So we've seen all of that. That is state law. Um, I don't know, I can't get in the minds of developers and what they wanna do with that. It's just this is a law that, that is allowed now and is a law that will be allowed in the future. People should know about it. And, and, and the only thing to add to that, uh, uh, we, we've heard the same uh, about the concerns and we're trying to get information in particular about when you get to six and seven, the actual uh, economic viability of it because it, the, the costs start to go up uh, as, as you get higher up. So we're, we're gonna work on that uh, to collect that info. We're working on that now. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I had to choose between a couple of my questions. So um, uh, I guess I wanted to ask, you had mentioned that uh, City Council always has the right to make the decision to not approve a project. Um, that, that When we were talking about water, you mentioned that that was an option. But my understanding was that if it's in the general plan, that they're, it's relatively prescriptive and that they're limited in their ability to block new construction. So I just wanted you to clarify. Sure. Um, so this, the state um, recently passed, uh, well, recent five years ago, um, passed legislation that said that a city cannot deny a housing project. Um, that is consistent with its general plan. Um, and that's where some of the lawsuits that have been happening that Kelsey um, had mentioned are, are stemming from that, that law. So that is actually true. So if, if the general plan allows, um, you know, I don't know, 20 units an acre, then on a, on, a pro on, a, on a parcel, then the city cannot ultimately deny that project. Before 2017, the city had full discretion to say, you know what, even though you met all of the zoning, we still don't want to approve it. So the state changed that um, to encourage housing to be built. Um, the question about water and, um, and moratoriums based on that, it's essentially a temporary moratorium. And um, I don't know, to be honest, I don't know how the city of Seaside is able to deny projects with the state law. So it's complicated because they are not approving projects because they don't have water, and yet they're still in conformance with the state, the state law. So it's complicated, and I don't really have a clear answer to that one. But I, I think that there are, there are mechanisms for the you know, places, locations, times where the city can say no. So then I guess my follow-up question to that is, um, because our housing element is essentially doing, we're doing three cycles of um, housing, right, for this, the state's number requirement as part of this general plan, um, with the extreme drought, are we locking ourselves into a pace of development because it will be in our general plan and therefore very difficult to stop? Um, even if we don't have the water, are we gonna be stuck with this 25 year projection at this yeah. increased rate. Okay, um, very complicated um, question. So first is 
um, the number of the two to three times arena, the 10,600 to 15,900, is a general target, a general range that we're shooting for when we're doing these alternatives. We don't know where it's gonna fall out in terms of this um, because we don't know what the land use plan is ultimately gonna be. It could be that it's, it's lower than that 10,900. The current general plan has 8,300 for what it predicted for the number of housing units. So if we're at the 10,600, and this is a longer time horizon, they did 20 years, we're doing 27 years. It's about the same pace, actually, as what the current general plan is. Um, and then, you know, as you saw from some of the charts, existing zoning actually changes um, some of the areas, at least where there's six stories, it spreads it out. Um, but, you know, we, the city can, can make some changes um, to its, its land uses over time. And I, the idea is that I don't think we're trying to lock in a future that, that can't be changed through policy later. Do you want to touch on the no net loss? Because I think that factors. Okay. Um, I think we can never predict the state. We can never predict if there will be a drought that lasts for decades. Uh, assuming uh, very extreme things don't happen, uh, the amount of growth that's being looked at right now is does not put any requirement on the city for the pace of any of it actually being built. Even with housing elements, uh, the state wants the city to uh, plan for a certain number of units that they 